So this is the final week of our four-week Advent series as uh, Advent uh, ends next weekend, in a sense. Uh, we've been looking at traditional Christmas songs and uh, this week's theme, as you can see on there, is love. And we're going to be looking at Oh Holy Night. There's a number of names up there. Each song in some way has been kind of connected to the Advent theme of the week. Now this week we're going to spend a little bit longer on the history than we have with the previous ones because the history is actually quite important in understanding what the song is saying. So it will help us a little bit. And also this is quite a controversial song and you'll find out why in a moment. Uh, but like I say, we've been looking at four different songs. So we started off with Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, which I said was a, an intro to the Advent season by Charles Wesley. The song explores the whole scope of biblical hope, so salvation history from the Old Testament through to the New Testament. So it's a great intro to the Advent season because it's all about hope as well. Then we looked at Hark the Herald Angel Sing, again by Charles Wesley, with some input from... The other names on the screen, George Whitfield, William Cummins and Felix Mendelssohn, which uh, encouraged us to sing as the angels did about the life changing good news for every man that Jesus is the Messiah. And then in our third song last week, we discovered a tune synonymous with Christmas that wasn't actually about Christmas. It was actually about the second coming because it was based on Psalm 98 and Revelation uh, chapter 22, verse 3. And so it wasn't actually a Christmas song, but it's become synonymous with Christmas because of the tune, because of the way we've sung it so much. It's something that's kind of stuck. And I left a challenge at the end that we should start singing it at other times of year. And maybe our musicians out there could maybe even put it to a different tune if, if the tune's gonna horrify people so much as it does for some people. But today we're gonna to be looking at Holy Holy Night. Now, like I said, it's a song that piques interest due to its popularity and notoriety in both church, history, and popular culture. So quite an interesting song for us to start with. And why do I say what I've just said? Well, firstly, we could start with the fact that this is a song that legend had it started a 24 hour ceasefire in the 1870 Franco-Prussian War, when on Christmas Eve, a French soldier leapt up onto the barricades and started singing it. And the, and the Prussians over the way there, they started singing Silent Night back at them. And there was a ceasefire for 24 hours and everybody got to celebrate Christmas. There's actually no proof that story is true. But if you go on the web and look at thousands of Christian websites, they repeat that story. Just because it's repeated doesn't mean it's true. Okay, but it's a legend. It's one of those things that is meant to have happened. However, what we can say about this tune, one thing that's really important, it was the, one of the first ever tunes to be broadcast on radio around the world. And it was actually the first song ever to be performed, the first tune, sorry, to ever be performed live on radio. The story goes that on December the 24th, 1906, Reginald Fessenden, used the alternator transmitter, which apparently in those days was used to broadcast Morse code to ships out at sea. And so what happened was, in a place called Brant Rock, this guy, he, he decided it would be a good idea to test whether it could, it could do more. And so he had a phonographic, a record player, and he stuck on a, a, a song called Ombra Me Fu Largo by George Frederick Handel. Now, and then he followed that by stopping the record, picking up his violin and playing Oh Holy Night. And apparently the response of Ho oh Holy Night made sailors at sea burst into tears because it was so beautiful. Now that bit is not legend. It is apparently true. But it was a complete shock to everybody listening because music had never been broadcast over the airways before. So it was one of the first two songs. It features regularly on, I think it's on Christmas Eve, midnight or about 11.30, BBC Two, uh, Carols from Kings on the BBC at Christmas, always on TV. And it's also the most covered Christmas song of all time. The most published 
by musicians on records. It's been covered by Nat King Cole, by Mariah Carey, Ceylon Dion, Josh Groban. It hasn't been covered, I'm afraid, by Cliff Richard, as far as I know. The cast of Glee, Ladywell Primary School, and many, many more. And it has charted in lots and lots of different places. There's even a guitar solo done by a heavy metal band called the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, which is performed quite regularly in front of masses of long-haired men who are all sort of sticking their hands in the air and going, yay. And if you actually watch the video, as a heavy metal fan, it's actually quite interesting because the guy is definitely worshipping as he performs this guitar solo because he raises his hands to heaven and points upwards as he's doing most of the solo with one hand. It's quite impressive. But there's another thing about this song. This song is legendary. It's legendary for brilliant singing or awful singing. And we had a variety of that tonight as we sung it. We had some amazing sort of notes being reached by various people whilst others of us were staying down here as far away as we could from the notes that might kill our throats. I could hear Mal and Rachel trying to hit them. Uh, but I could also hear myself and her husband not quite getting there. But renditions of this really bad versions of this go viral online, but also really good renditions of it go viral online. And it's legendary for the idea that this is a song that breaks glasses. That's how high and how good it is. So this is a legendary song. This is one that is ingrained into our Christmas spirit, as I've said, in both the church world, in the secular world, everywhere. This is a common song and it's sung in many different ways. So let's look at the song. Let's start by looking at the words. And the first thing I'm going to show you is this. There are actually two versions of this song. There is the French version and the English version. And what's interesting is that the French version is still sung today. And that's why I've put both of them up there. Because we tend in the ang anglicized world to sing the English version. But the French version is the original version. It's where the song comes from. It's what it was originally meant to be. It's what originally stopped the troops fighting. It's what was played on the violin by the guy who played it. This was, the, this was the, the words that might have been in his head. But there is a sense in which that is the original song, but it is still sung today. So we can't completely ignore it. We can't ignore it. The English version was done uh, 10 years later. And there was a purpose behind it, which we're going to get into when we look at the history. But I'm going to read it out to you. Let me start with the French version. It's, Midnight Christians, it is the solemn hour when God as man descended amongst us to expunge the stain of original sin and to put an end to the wrath of his father. The entire world thrills with hope on this night which gives us a saviour. People on your knees, behold your deliverance. Christmas, Christmas, here is the Redeemer. Christmas, Christmas, here is the Redeemer. The ardent light of our faith guides us all to the cradle of the infant, as in ancient times a brilliant star conducted the Magi there from the Orient. The King of Kings was born in a humble manger. O mighty ones of today, proud of your grandeur, it is to your pride that God preaches. Bow your heads before the Redeemer. Bow your heads before the Redeemer. The Redeemer has broken all shackles. The earth is free and heaven is open. He sees a brother where there was once but a slave. Love unites those who restrain the sword. Who will tell him our gratitude? It is for us all that he was born, that he suffered and died. People, stand up, sing your deliverance. Christmas, Christmas, let us sing the Redeemer. Christmas, Christmas, let us sing the Redeemer. That's a literal translation of the French version. Now for the English version. O oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Saviour's birth. 
Long they the world in sin and error pining, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, O hear the angel voices, O night divine, O night when Christ was born, O night, O holy night, O night divine. Led by the light of faith, serenely beaming, with glowing hearts by his cradle we stand. So led by light of a star sweetly gleaming, here came the wise men from Orient land. The king of kings lay thus in lowly manger, in all our trials born to be our friend. He knows our need, to our weakness is no stranger. Behold your king, before him lowly bend. Behold your king, before him lowly bend. Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chain shall he break for the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we, raise we. Let all within us praise his holy name. Christ is the Lord, who praise his name forever. His power and glory evermore. His power and glory evermore. Proclaim. So there you go, those are two songs. So let's look at the history, because the history is quite important and quite interesting. And what's interesting about our two translations is they are quite different, and yet at the same time, they are similar. There are similarities, but great differences. And you may notice one feels more theological, the other one feels more wonder and amazement. So there's sort of differences between them that are quite strong and, and interesting. So how did we come to the situation where we came up with two very different songs still being sung in different parts of the world? Unlike many of our Christmas songs where they were adapted and they became popular later and so we only sing one version, this is definitely sung in two different versions. And actually what's interesting as well is quite often some of the more secular versions absolutely butcher it. They rip entire verses out. They don't even care, the secular world. They just love the, the niceness of it uh, and, and the, the, the nice notes. But, but for us, this is what we read. So what is the story of this hymn? Well, it started in a very humble, uh, quiet and humble way. Basically, a new organ or a stained window was installed at a church, a Catholic church, Rock and Mare in France in 1843. And this being installed was a great thing for the church. It was a great thing. So, but it was still quite a small occasion in, in the grand scope of the universe. However, the priest, a father Pettigen, now this isn't Father Pettigen on the screen. This is actually a father Pettigen who was the first Catholic priest of Japan and established the church there, but it was the only Father Pettigene I could find online. So he's up there, okay? Father Pettigene. He thought to himself, it would be good to celebrate the installation of this organ or the stained window at Christmas at the church. And so, and so he decided to get a specially written poem about Christmas written. And so he approached one Placide Capo, who agreed to do it. That's the fellow in the corner there. Lovely looking young fellow. What you can't see there is he's missing a hand, which is kind of interesting. Now, Placide Capo was an interesting but obvious choice for the task in the village itself. Born in France in 1808 to 1887, uh, 1808, and he died in 1887, he was born at 8 p.m. Uh, the 25th of October 1808. He was the son of a cooper, and he may well have followed in his father's business, but aged eight, a playmate accidentally shot him in the hand with a gun he was playing with, and the hand had to be amputated. He instead followed an academic career, paid for by the shooter's father. And he was a talented artist, which was quite cool because he only had one hand, and yet he was still really, really talented. Even as a one-handed man, he showed great talent. And he actually won an award from the College Royale d'Avignon. He then studied literature in Nimes and law in Paris and was licensed to practice law in 1831. However, he instead became a merchant of wines and spirits. But his focus was really on literature and was a gifted 
poet. Now, it's still a bit of a puzzle why our, why our bearded friend here, Father Pettigeen, approached him, even though he was the natural person in the village to go to, there were still some issues with our guy. The first one was, was that Capo was an avowed atheist and a vocal anti-cleric. He didn't like the clergy at all. So this was a man who was an atheist and a vocal anti-cleric. So it's, you sort of think to yourself, mm, if you're gonna approach somebody, I might try and find somebody in the church. But no, our father, maybe he was thinking to himself, I have an idea, I've got an atheist in the village, maybe if I get him to write a Christmas song, he'll come to church on Christmas day, read this, and we've got him. <laughs> maybe, maybe. However, something really interesting did happen, and I'm not gonna say, no, there was no great conversion experience. However, Capo agreed to do it, and actually took it very seriously. He spent many hours researching the book of Luke. And so after researching the book of Luke, Capo wrote the poem, Minui Chrétiens, Midnight Christians. Now I don't know about you, but we know that this guy up here was an academic. So when I talk about him studying the book of Luke, I mean he studied the book of Luke. Now you know when I study any book of the Bible, I have about 10 other books open at the same time. And I'm quite often cross-referencing with other parts of the Bible. This guy knew how to do that. And there's a very big chance he did exactly the same. He studied the book. He made sure he knew what he was talking about. And he came up with this song, O Holy Night, O Holy Night. And it was performed at the church originally as a poem. Now the story's a bit hazy at this point as to what happened next. Some say the priest on hearing the poem said to Capo, you've got to put this to music. Some said that Capo, remember he's French, had a French moment and thought to himself, I've done something tremendously excellent and decided that it would be good to music. Some say that a a lady, uh, an opera singer called Emily Laurie, was at the church that, not, that night and heard, heard it, and she said it should be put to music. There are three different stories that we can get from history about who decided it should be set to music. And so already we're seeing some things happen. By the way, some historians say that it was put to music before the service. That can't be true, because the story actually goes, the original story is that he actually only finished it an hour before Christmas. The actual writing of the poem. That's how committed he was. He was still perfecting it at the last minute. Sometime later, in either 1843 or 1847, Adolf Adam, was brought into it. Now, he was a composer of secular operas. He was most famous for the ballet Gisele. You might have heard of that. Uh, any ballet dancers here would definitely have heard of it. Anybody who's into that sort of thing would have heard of it. And he decided he would actually set it to music. However, he didn't pay much attention to it. It wasn't a big deal to him. It was kind of something he did as a bit on the side. And from that, it became an instant hit amongst French churches. It kind of just flew out. It was an instant hit with churchgoers. They loved it. It was brilliant. It was a song that lifted people, a song that people just sang at Christmas with all their hearts. They sang it. They really, the, the congregations got into it. However, the song did not go down well with the hierarchy within the Catholic Church. And there was a number of reasons. For instance, you may notice within the song, there are a few lines that the Catholic Church wasn't too pleased with. You might not have noticed them. They didn't like the bit about to expunge the stain of original sin. They did not like the idea that Jesus came to put an end to the wrath of his father. They felt it was too harsh, too tough. Now, interestingly, it's actually quite biblical. It's not. That at all. But also, 
they decided that they could see liberation theology within it. Now, when they meant liberation theology, they meant viva la revolution. Now, remember the revolution had been very, very cruel to the Catholic Church in France. It had not been a good thing for the Catholic Church. The people had rose up. They had thrown off the shackles of the monarchy, but also the Catholic Church had, had been punished quite often by atheistic parts within the party. Many Catholics had been persecuted for their faith during this period. And so now they were at a different time. They did not want the revolution to come back. And so they saw that within that. But at the same time, they had other issues. They had an issue with the fact that Placido Capo was an avowed atheist. And it also began to be circulated that Adolf Adam was a Jew. Now, the Catholic Church in France was quite anti-Semitic. So this being circulated was something that did not go down well with the hierarchy. So the Catholic Church tried to ban this song. The problem was the people wouldn't let it be banned. By the way, the claim that Adolf Adam was a Jew is completely untrue. He was buried a Catholic. We can actually go and visit his Catholic grave. And if any of you know anything about Catholics and Anglicans back in that period, you did not get buried as a Catholic or an Anglican in, in the normal graveyard. You were put in a Jewish graveyard, which was as far away as you could get, along with the Baptists, the nonconformists, and various other people. Most of us here would have been in a, we wouldn't have been allowed to be consecrated burials. But he was, so we know he wasn't a Jew. However, however, the French local congregational Catholics, the believers in the pews, loved this song so much that they refused not to sing it. And so the song continued to flourish within the French Catholic Church and probably within French areas of the world. Ten years later, something happened. This guy came along, John S. Dwight, a publisher from America. It's quite interesting, this guy. I, I've read a lot about him over the last week, and, and he's an interesting character. When he heard the song, he didn't just hear a beautiful song. He saw something that was important to politics in America at the time. You might not realize this, but in front of you, he saw a song that was about abolition, the freeing of the slaves. And so when he got hold of the song, he saw abolitionist undertones in the third verse, which he purposely developed and made a little more blatant. Now, in the US, the Civil War was fast approaching. It was only 10, 15 years away by the time he got hold of the song. And so this song, once it was adapted, took off in the north of the country, not so much in the south, the slave-owning states, for reasons that are very obvious when you actually read the song. And Dwight also did some other things that were very good to the song as well. I'm not convinced that's a good thing to politicise a hymn. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you about that. I'm not sure that's a great idea. However, he did some other things that were quite good with the song. Dwight also added the idea of the incarnation being on a holy night and being a holy event, which is not so blatant in the first version. And so what he does is he adds wonder to the song. He adds that sense of being lifted on wings that some people get when they sing it to it, a sense of wonder and awe. And as I've often, as I've been reading it this week, in my mind, Capo nails the theology, but doesn't quite grasp what John Dwight does in he grasps the awe and wonder of the night. The awe and wonder. The wonder of faith comes to the song because John S. Dwight was a Christian. He had some weird beliefs but he was a Christian. And so in some sense, Dwight takes some of the, the, the sort of theological depth out and replaces it with awe and wonder. But don't worry, it doesn't become a Jesus is my girlfriend song for those of you who are worried about it. Okay, 
Nothing like that. Now, there are some difficulties with Dwight. You see, we may have had difficulties with Placid, Pl Placide. We might have had problems with Adolphe. Uh, we might, but there are also problems with John S. Dwight. You see, Dwight belonged to a movement called Transcendentalism. Now, Transcendentalism was a reaction against intellectualism. And guess what? Placido was an intellectual. That's why he was an atheist. And so he writes his song as a reaction, in one sense, to the fact that the song was written by an intellectual. And he was against intellectualism within the church. The idea of actually thinking through your faith, not checking your brains at the door, was very much something he, he, was, he was sort of against. Don't think about it. Just let love flow. Just let it. A simple and maybe slightly inaccurate comparison is with the idea that you don't need to read your Bible. Just listen to the Spirit nudging you through your feelings. That's what he thought. He also had this idea that every single one of us, no matter who you were, were just so full of love. Whether you were saved or not. You were inherit inherently good. Not what the Bible teaches, that we are inherently sinful because we inherit the sin of Adam in our life. The original sin that Placido talks about in his song. Therefore, how could God be angry with us? We are creatures of his love. And so he had these sort of ideas. And so we can't say that, yes, thank goodness, the song got into the hands of somebody who who had it all together. No, we, we can't even say that because there is, there is issues with it. Uh, he also wrote a, a, a thing called the Journal of Music, which was his sort of his work. And I'm going to be honest with you, he was a bit of a hack. Now, I don't know whether you know what that means, but it means he really didn't know what he was talking about when it came to music. In fact, one composer laid a trap for him one night for his journal to show it how much of a hack he was. He played two songs and he purposely put in the pamphlet he made that the, the song that he had composed was written by Handel and the song that Handel had composed was written by him. And John S. Dwight ripped into the song that he put under his own name and said how amazing the song was by Handel. Bit of a hack. So this is the problem sometimes. We've got to be careful in, in saying just because a Christian is writing something that, that it's all going to be great and, and, and wonderful. However, however, both of them did write something that was good and something that was worthy of singing, especially if we think about it and start thinking about what the songs actually contain. Sometimes we have to reinterpret the words through the light of the Bible to understand or to make a song work in a sense. I know that sounds like a bit of a heretical thing to say, but there's nothing blatantly bad about either song. Not blatantly. Not if you think about it and get into them. So we have to sometimes be careful to, to rub something out just because of the, the background of somebody. We've often seen that there are songs in our hymn books that have been written by people who have fallen back into sin. Do we start singing, stop singing that song because the person who wrote it has fallen back into sin? No, we don't. However, if there is heresy within that song, then yes, we do. If there is something that obviously is against God's word, then yes, we stop singing it. And in both of these songs, in both translations, there is nothing inherently wrong with what Eva has wrote. And so neither do we get a pen and say, no more shall we. I wouldn't have got Mel to sing it at the beginning of the service if I felt that was the case. So in summary, O Holy Night is an incredibly popular Christmas song that was requested by a priest to celebrate an organ, written by an atheist inspired by Luke's gospel, put to music by a nominal Christian, banned by the Catholic Church, translated into, into English by a Christian with some interesting beliefs to combat slavery in the United States, and a song that if heard in French is quite different to what is heard in English. And on top of that, it is difficult to sing. And so today we're gonna to look 
at this song. I'm going to be quite brief on this. I'm not going to be as long as I have been on the history. The history is actually quite interesting because it teaches us how to look at songs, how we should actually sit down and think about what we're singing very carefully. We can find beauty and good theology even in songs from the secular world if we're willing to look. That's how great our God is. He's able to send his beauty anywhere and everywhere. But in this song, we do have some incredible things we can learn. And I'm going to be commenting as if I'm commenting on both songs, not just on the one. So first up, we can start with an important fact that we can discern from the history of the song Capo based this song on. It's a serious exploration of Luke's gospel. And Luke's gospel has some unique qualities that are important to somebody who hasn't got faith exploring the gospel. Firstly, it is the longest of the gospels. It starts earlier in Jesus' life than the others and ends later. Now, anybody who goes away from here and goes and checks this out, you'll notice that in Mark's gospel, in our modern versions, it looks as if they end at the same spot. But actually, Mark's, some manuscripts of Mark's gospel don't have the ascension. OK, so when I say this, we can say that without doubt, the ascension is in Luke's gospel. There's no doubt about that. No, no literary criticist or anybody will go against that. It goes to, the, to Jesus' life. It goes up to the ascension. Only Luke reveals anything about Jesus' childhood describing his family's visit to Jerusalem when he was 12 years old. You can find that in Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. So Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52 talks about Jesus as a child. So we know he was a child at some point. He didn't appear as a man. Uh, he was a man eventually, but he didn't come out of his mother's womb as a man. He came as a baby and grew like a normal human being. Luke is the only gospel writer to provide a sequel, the book of Acts. That means Kapow, reading this, could have very easily have gone straight into the next book and read the impact that this gospel had on people, but also see a connection that this was an onward thing. He could have seen the importance of faith to the people who, to whom he was writing this song to. So Luke, only Luke's gospel does that. Luke intends his book to be read by non-Jewish Christian readers and to have an evangelistic edge. So it's the perfect book for an atheist in a sense. So using Luke would have given Capo much more information to use and due to the book's intention of being read by non-Jewish Christian readers and at the same time have an evangelistic edge, it would have been more accessible to an atheist like Capo. So what does he get from this? What do both writers see in this song that we can agree on and see in both songs a little bit being pulled out of both. Well, there's a number of things. And the first is this. We start in the first line. Like Luke, Capo addresses this song to believers. He starts by saying, midnight Christians, it is the solemn hour. Midnight Christians. And I love the idea of a soldier, a French soldier, standing up on, on the barricades and shouting out, Midnight Christians, it is the solemn hour, or singing it out loud. And Christians on the other side of the fence going, oh, It's midnight, it's Christmas. And the, and the Prussian soldiers getting the same realization. So for us, it does that. It brings our attention to the moment. It says, now is the time. In verse 2, he talks of the ardent light of our faith. So he's talking about Jesus as being the light of our faith. If you have faith, he is your light. And he is here. He has come. He is here now. And so we've got this opening thing, and then we've got verse 2 mentioning it as well. This idea that this is a song for believers. To sing with all their heart. And from that they begin, they begin something very, very important. They begin to focus on the incarnation. Now, a major theme of all the Gospels is the incarnation. You do realise what the incarnation means, don't you? It means God in flesh. That is the Gospel. 
not only is Jesus the incarnation as a baby, he's the incarnation as a child. He's, an, he's the incarnation as a man. He's the incarnation on the cross. He's the incarnation in death. He's the incarnation in his resurrection and he's the incarnation in his ascension and he will be the incarnation when he comes back again. He is in bodily form. He is in flesh. And so it's the whole of his life that he is talking about. But here we are focusing on one aspect of the song. It is the night of the dear Saviour's birth. As the English version says, the internal son became the incarnate son. As it says in Luke chapter 1, verses 30 to 33. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And so we have this focusing upon the incarnation, the happening of the incarnation, happening right now. And as we said, in the English version, there is more emphasis put on the idea that this is a special moment for all mankind. This is important. This is something you need to take notice of and celebrate and remember. It is different to any other day in history. The Son of God became man. I don't know whether you noticed, but in the first, in the first song, the actual first line says, O holy night, the stars are brightly shining. Now, what I noticed in that when I was reading this was the fact that we've got this holy different night that is completely different and yet the stars are doing exactly what they do every night of the year they are shining brightly this amazing incarnation happens in a very ordinary way on a very ordinary night in many senses and that is what Jesus comes from he comes from the majesty of heaven where it is absolutely awe-inspiring 24-7 and he brings that awe-inspiring wonderfulness to our earth our ordinary mundane earth and lives so that's what the song is saying lift up your heads for that what else does it do this song shows us the deepest human need. Both Dwight and Capo then draw our attention to the purpose as to why Christ comes in human flesh. He assumes humanity to deliver us from sin, death and eternal condemnation. In one of them it says, long they the world in sin and error pining. The stain of sin that causes guilt and enslavement needed to be dealt with. Needed to be dealt with. Why? Because of the wrath of the Father. If we were to stand before the Father, his wrath would be poured out for us. So Capo points that out in his. He says, put an end to the wrath of the Father. That's what he's come, to turn his wrath away from us, to the believer, to you, Christians. That is what he has done. And so this happened through the death and resurrection of Christ and our participation in that historical event. Our sin also leads to error pining. We don't speak that way anymore, but pining simply means languishing. And so we were languishing in sin. That's us, that's our sin is, is causing us to do that. And so humanity apart from Christ and in sin languishes in, her in, in error. We are in need of the gospel, in need of our, our salvation, of exactly what Christ comes to give. As it says in Luke 19, and, and I put 1 to 10 up there because you could go and lead, read the entire story if you want. It's the, uh, the tax collector guy whose name has slipped out of my mind at this point. But he says this at the end when the guy actually starts to respond to Jesus. Today, salvation has come to this house for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. That's what happens in that story of the tax collector. He's up the tree and he, Jesus comes by. And he changes his entire life because of what Jesus says and does 
in front of him. He changes. And so it emphasizes a fresh start for man. This is what both of these songs are talking about. The entire world thrills with hope at this. It's a thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices. For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. And that's the next thing it mentions. So it emphasizes a fresh start for man, a new life. A new glorious moan has broken into the old fallen creation. It is a new, fresh day, a fresh start. Yesterday is gone with all its issues today. It's a brand new day with fresh hope for everyone. And the sunrise motif that we talked about last week is mentioned in the song as well. So we have this idea that that's, that's what it's, it's kind of saying. It's a new, new day, a fresh dawn. And, you know, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. The sun comes up. It's a fresh start for man, a new life. And so as Zechariah says in Luke chapter 1, verses 78, 79, the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. And so we're, again, another biblical image there in the song implied within what's going on. But then we move on to this. We get the benefits of this fresh start joy and hope for the soul. Now, for, throughout the song, we see the benefits for those who would see here and trust in God's saving gift, Christ, and the fresh start sunrise he brings. At Christ's appearance, the soul felt its worth. A weary soul feels a thrill of hope and rejoices. And we feel worthy because of who we are in Christ, and we feel joy over what he has done on our behalf. Now, we see this throughout Luke's gospel. Mary, Elizabeth, Zechariah, the shepherds, all exhibit this in Luke's Christmas narrative. And we see it happen every time Jesus performs a miracle. Awe and wonder, joy is brought to the people who have things healed, whose lives are saved. Their lives are changed. Sometimes Jesus has to tell people to not go out and tell anyone about it. He actually does that. He said, don't go out and tell anyone about this because the time's not right. Others, he says, go and tell everybody. Because they are changed, it's made a huge difference. And that's what happens to us. There is joy and hope for the soul. And it's shown in this song. And so in this song, we are introduced to God's glorious incarnational presence and the action of it. The song just screams it out at us. It just has so much in there. We talk about, you know, what he's come to do. We've got this, we've got how humble he is. We've got the fact that he's the king of kings. And then we've got, he's broken all the shackles. The earth is free, heaven is open. All these things that are sort of showing us incarnational glory or what is better known as, there's, there's a word for this, which is a theology of glory or a doxological glory, a theology of praise. The reason for our praise the reason for our awe and joy is found in God incarnate. And so what is our response to that? Our response is to fall on our knees. Behold the Redeemer, bow our heads, let all within us praise his holy name. Because divine presence and action naturally generates human praise or should it should generate that. If you see God at work in your life, does it not make you want to praise him? Amen. But there's something else that's included in this song. You see, human praise or doxology should always also produce an ethical response, a response in our life. And so doxological theology leads to doxological ethics. That's a lovely phrase, but it makes me sound really intelligent. I'm going to let you into a little secret. I had no idea what that meant at the beginning of the week. <laughs> okay, I read it somewhere and thought, I better go and find out what that means. So don't think I'm clever. Okay, in the third verse, we see that doxological theology leads to doxological ethics. A life lived in the light of the glory of the incarnation, the birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and eventual return of our Lord and Saviour. That's what doxological ethics is. I'll say it again. A life lived in the light of the glory of the incarnation, the birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and eventual return of our Lord and Saviour. That's what doxological ethics are. 
we've seen his glory, we know of his glory, we know what he's done, we think it's absolutely fantastic, amazing, awesome. And so we respond with our lives, not just with praise and worship, but with our lives every single second. In the first song, he uses language, I think, better than the second one because he's politicised in the second one, but still we can turn it to that. We can imagine it like that. We can forget about the politics and, and mean this, OK? Mean it in this way. Mean it. In both songs, the slave is liberated. Slaves to what? Sin, obviously. And a brotherhood is formed between those who believed in the latter one and with our Lord in the earlier version. And that is biblical. Hebrews 2.11 says this, for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus is not ashamed to call you a brother. That's how intimate the relationship is with our Lord and Saviour. And that's how intimate our relationship is meant to be with each other as well because of doxological epics. That is it. We have a brotherhood. We've been freed from sin. Freed. We're no longer slave. And so the phrase brother brings us into, a, it reminds us of the kinship that is based on love first for our saviour and then our fellow brothers. But remember, Jesus' command to love went further than just our fellow believer. The good Samaritan, he told us to love, our, he loved the Lord our God with all our heart, mind and strength and to love our neighbour as ourselves. He called us to do that. His law is love and peace. And, and we see that in both of them. Both of them, this calling to love our neighbour. In the first one, it talks about love uniting those who restrain the sword. What is the greatest thing we can do? Not kill our neighbour. Not steal from them. Not take things from them. Restrain the sword. That's what those troops hopefully did on that night. They restrained the sword. The reason I say it might not be a true story is because when the one happened in the First World War, they said actually it took months to get them back to fighting because they all realised how awful the war was. And I do wonder about the fact that they went back to fight in Boxing Day in the earlier story. But we're called to restrain the sword. Whereas in the other, it talks about, he taught us to love one another and all oppression shall cease. We don't oppress our neighbours anymore. And so the Good Samaritan really echoes all of that. And our God would have known that. And so it gives a sense of our Love for the Lord leading to love for our neighbour, not just in thought, but in deed as well. The Son calls us to treat others as we've been treated with love in our daily lives. And why? Because we were once slaves to sin, but now we have received the liberating love of God in Christ that's free for us to live. So don't just praise him with your mouth with this song, but live it in your lives through the power of the Spirit. And so I say to you, we are left with a song by an atheist that is more challenging to us as Christians than some mainstream hymns written by Christians, particularly in the first one. I actually prefer the first one, I'm going to be honest with you. That may not be a surprise to you who know my comments about Jesus is my girlfriend type songs. Uh, I tend to find I love songs with good theology in. If you've got good theology in your life, you can live it. You can live the life easier because it gives you so much assurance to know what you believe in. It does. But I'm not, all, I'm not going to run the second song down either. Again, we've got a Christian with a few dodgy ideas that he's living out in his life. But he does write a song that lifts the spirit, that helps us to see the awe and majesty of the occasion that is the incarnational night, the day the incarnation was born. Christmas night. And so this is a song of praise and worship to our Lord and Saviour, for the awesomeness of who he is, the glory of all he has done for us, and committing ourselves to living our lives as an act of daily worship, to obediently following and living in the way he taught us to live, the way of love, the way of peace, through the power of the Holy Spirit, for the joy and hope set before us in Christ. Therefore, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12, a verse that we've been looking at in some detail. So let's take this on board 
As we sing these songs at Christmas, let's think about the words. What are they saying? What are we committing ourselves to? If you sing this song, either of the two versions, with faith, you are committing yourself to Christ. You are committed to seeing his awesomeness, his glory, his majesty. And you are committing to living in the light of that. That doesn't make the song holy, by the way. It's not the word of God, but it is inspired by the word of God. And so it has things we can learn from, from it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for this Christmas. We thank you and praise you for the incarnation. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to this earth. And we thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to come and you were willing to live on this earth, this rather mundane place for someone who came from glory. And I thank you for the work you did. I thank you for the fact that you died upon that cross. I thank you for the fact that you rose again. And I thank you that you're now seated at the right hand of God and that you sent the Holy Spirit into our lives so that we could understand all of this. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will open our eyes up to what we are thinking about this Christmas. May you open our hearts up to the words of this glorious story of Jesus coming to this earth to live amongst us, to fulfill the Father's mission. And we just thank you for it, Lord. Praise your name for it. In Jesus' name. Amen.